Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning and those of you watching online. Welcome to the Circleville Christian Church. Glad that all of you are here to have a very special day of worshiping and praising God this morning. Got a couple announcements. Today is our annual business meeting immediately following the, the church service this morning. And if you're, we'd love for you to stay and, and, uh, and, and uh, attend the annual business meeting as we go over some things. And also, if you've paid for your meal for Adult Night Out, where you're welcome to come at 6 o'clock tonight is Adult Night Out, and the meal will be held in the Fellowship Hall. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, Lord, for the day that you've given us, so thankful that we have the opportunity to freely be here this morning to worship and to praise you. And I just pray, Lord, this morning that everything we say and do will bring honor and glory to your holy name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
to greet one another.
sound of a symphony to my ears is like holy water, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears is like holy water on my skin is like holy
as we come to our time of communion this morning. After I'm done praying, the ushers will pass the communion, and I'm asking that please don't put your empty communion cups in the offering in the offering bucket. Okay. I've entitled my communion meditation this morning, Having a Relationship with Jesus. And unlike world religions, Christianity is about having a personal relationship with Christ. And the core belief of Christianity are summarized by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you are hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I have received I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. Jesus died for our sins, was buried and resurrected, and thereby offers salvation to all through faith who believe in him. Unique from all other world religions, Christianity is more about a relationship than religious practices. Instead of adhering to a list of do's and don'ts, the goal of a Christian is to cultivate a close walk with God. The relationship is made possible because of the work of Jesus Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What many people don't know, realize, or even care about is that Jesus gave us the most amazing gift, the opportunity to spend eternal life in heaven with him. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God became a human being in the person of Jesus to take our sin. He died a horrible death, only to be raised again, proving his victory over sin and death. And Romans 8.1 tells us that, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we accept this gift, we have become acceptable to God and can have a relationship with him. This personal relationship with God is not as hard to find as what we might think. And there is no mysterious formula to get it. And as soon as we become children of God, we receive the Holy Spirit who will begin to work on our hearts. We should pray without ceasing. Read the Bible. Attend a Bible-believing church such as ours here in Circleville. And all these things will help us grow spiritually, trusting in God to get us through each day and believing that he is our sustainer is the way to have a relationship with him. See, Christianity is not about signing up for a religion. Christianity is about being born into the family of God. It's a relationship. And when we join his family through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside, inside of our hearts. He empowers us to live like children of God. He does not ask us to try to attain holiness by our own strength, as religion does, but he asks us that our old self be crucified with him so that he so that his power can live through us. God wants us to know him. He wants us to draw near to him, to pray to him, and to love him above everything. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. As we're about to take our communion, and I just pray, Heavenly Father, that each time we take our communion, we understand what we're doing. We understand that you loved us all enough to go to that cross, and he died for our sins. And in doing so, we should have the opportunity each day to remember that. And on this Sunday morning, let us be reminded of, of that bread, that body broken for us on that cross and the cup representing the blood that you shed that blood that washed away our sins 
We're just so thankful, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that you continue to bestow upon each and every one of us. We're so thankful for the mercy. We're so thankful for the grace. And above all, we're so thankful that you loved us enough to go to the cross. We just praise you, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd ask if you're listening online, if you want to consider giving tithes and offerings, uh, you can look on our website at the tithes and offerings button and give through tithely securely there. Or if you'd like to, you can bring uh, tithes and offerings in or mail them uh, to Andrew here at the church office. So please let, help join me praying for our tithes and offerings. Lord, uh, we thank you so much uh, for the gifts that you so freely give. Lord, we ask that you... Make us mindful this week of those things that come into our lives that are just um, quote-unquote incidents, that uh, just things that come up. Lord, uh, let us be generous with our time, talents, and treasures this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
give me assurance that I'll see his glory face to goes before me, defender behind me, I won't be, I'm filled with anointing, my cup's overflowing, no weapon can harm me. Do you always feel that confident? Anyone got a doubt issue? Well, I'll mention trust. How about that? How about a trust issue? Or do we live in a world that really doesn't have too many things that rattle our, our trust and, sh- and give us doubts? What do you think? Um, I am a naturally trusting person. I'm, I'm happier that way. <clears throat> when I trust somebody, even though I think they're probably going to burn me, I'm, I'm just happier about who I am, which means I spend a lot of time getting burned. Um, and some of those times are by me. But it, it's interesting to think about. How, anyone ever had some time where you really, really felt burned? Or you really got cheated? I got a couple of nods. The rest of you are lying. Um, have you ever thought you got burned and found out later you were wrong and actually everything had been done in good faith and it was all okay we uh we live in a fairly conflicted world right now is that fair and it's not just the obvious things where people tend to distrust each other and distrust everything around them but i mean uh, we have divided up everything we can possibly divide haven't we I mean, we've got a nation founded on faith, and now we've divided it up between perspectives. I mean, you can find division and arguments between uh, how we should medically treat people now and whether or not they should get shots over a thousand things, not just what's popular right now. We can, we can divide up, hey, we can divide up over KU, K-State, can't we? But Mike, I've got to tell you, I've been cheering for KU football for a long time. But uh, even though I, I'm purple. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can divide up over a lot of stuff that really... You know, it's just much easier when we can say, you're the bad guy and I'm the good guy, right? And we can doubt other people and doubt their intentions. And, and man, it's just a whole lot simpler if I'm always the good guy and you're always the bad guy. It doesn't work out to make us very right very often. How, how many times have you doubted somebody and, and, and come away saying, I feel so much healthier and holier because I doubted them? How many times have you doubted God and come away going, I feel so much wiser and so much more fulfilled? Anyone ever doubt God? I'm going to challenge that maybe we have a whole lot just because of, well, we're people. And doubt's been here from the beginning. I want to walk through just seven verses of the third chapter of Genesis and just talk a little about doubt and, and where it comes from and what it looks like. The third chapter there in Genesis, the first seven verses read this way. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Who do you listen to? We listen to a lot of different voices. Some of them outside us, some of them inside us. But I want to walk through the voices that get used here in this short piece and just touch on some thoughts. So first of all, if you've never read this before, it's been a long time. The serpent gets later defined, and it's, it's Satan's embodiment. So we don't, it's not just, a, just, not just a snake running around out there, in case you wondered. But watch what Satan says. Very first, he says, this, it says uh, did God really say? First thing he says, did God really say? Think about that in our current culture. How many topics... Does our world go, God doesn't really address that, does he? Even if I believe him, did he really? That's the first thing that Satan did. He brought doubt. And there are three kinds of doubt that get mentioned just in this little tiny piece. The first is the obvious one. It's the doubt in God. Did God really say anything at all about this? So many things God does say things about. Um. Ever known anyone who lied about anything? Did God say anything about that? Um, think God ever says things because He's looking for our benefit? How many times did you lie and go, Oh, that was a good one. I'm going to celebrate that one for a long time. And how many of our lies do at some point we go, See, now I've got to cover it. Now I've got to replicate it. And I've got to make sure I don't get caught. And then I have to, and it grows. Just, just one little thing to touch on there. Think of some of the things that our culture teaches that God has spoken about. Um, you know, oh, hey, here's a popular one. Uh, through Paul, does God ever say, hey, that profanity thing, stop it? Man, that's a little tough, tough, isn't it? Because some of us have used language that probably is a little sharper than needed. And God says, no, as a, as a growth in holiness, we give that up. Paul says, stop it. Um, so God's spoken on that. Is that one done with? No one ever has that trouble anymore. Hmm. Um. Yeah, what, what, somebody explain what a social influencer is to me. Because I, I don't do a whole lot of this stuff where people, I don't know, the, the, the Twitter thing and the, and the TikTok thing. Anyone of you do any of that? Somebody un, un, younger than me has to be on some of those things. What, what is a social influencer? Can somebody define that for me? Because it's a popular thing right now. And, and I, I see that a social influencer says, and I read what they say, and I'm like, Really? That's what you're bringing to the table? I, I was reading one social influencer who said that young people today do not have the strength to control their sexual urges and should not be expected to wait until marriage. They're not strong enough. They went on to say adults today aren't strong enough and they should be free to run around and do whatever they want. Social influencer. I'm wondering if maybe we ought to term some of them anti-social influencers. I'm not so sure. But my question is, did God say? On a million topics, has God spoken? And if so, where do I place my doubt? Where do I place my trust? Um, straight up, anyone here ever sinned before? Okay, when we have sinned, what percentage of the time was it by mistake? 
less than or more than zero. You get my drift, right? I, I mean, most of us don't sin by mistake. Most of us go, and I want, will, do, whatever. I, 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 did God say, I, la, 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 I'm not listening? Or just, I don't think God was right. And we go make our own way. And then we try to make our way back. Thank goodness we have a Savior. Thank goodness the forgiveness that Lyle just talked about, right? The relationship that draws us back and lets us come home a thousand times over and over again. Here's the question I have. If God has spoken, what was His intent? Was His intent to ruin things or make things better? And the first thing Satan says, did God really say? Brings a doubt towards God. But think about this. If, if Jesus is right, John 15, 11, he says, I've warned you about these things. I've set you up to understand these things so that you, your joy can be complete. And 1 Timothy six seventeen, this idea that we trust God because he has provided everything for our enjoyment. How many of our mistakes we've made have been reaching for joy or enjoyment when God has said, I've got that. Listen to me. This is everything I've given you. It's for your joy and your enjoyment. Stay with me. Don't try to figure it out on your own. I've, I, I made you. I know how this works. And so when we have doubt, how many times do we doubt God? Oh, it's got to be daily. But there's a second piece of this because he says, did God really say, you know who else that makes me doubt? If I'm Eve, did God really say, then I have to play back through and go, did he? See, now who am I doubting? Now I'm doubting me. Right? Anyone ever have any self-doubt? Anyone ever go through the, I can't, I won't, I don't, I shouldn't, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough, I fall short? Doubt of self breeds great successes or none. Interesting that Satan's question here to Eve was pronged in three different ways. The first is doubt God. The second is doubt self. And uh, Satan's whispers, right? You are not good enough. Ever have that one whisper through your head? You are not enough. You don't have the ability. You don't have the intelligence. You don't have the experience. Those are the whispers of Satan. Here's the whispers of God. Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He uses the word there that means explosive power. It's the word from which we get our word dynamite. Through Christ, the explosive ability. Uh, Joshua 1.9, when Joshua is struggling with the idea that he's got to lead all God's people, God says to him, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's not the last time he'll say that to him either. The whispers of Satan, whispers of God. Who should you doubt? Doubt God, doubt Satan, doubt yourself, doubt Satan. But there's this third thing. By the way, we can doubt anything, can't we? Ever had anything you, were, you, you think maybe you were good at, but you weren't so sure? You know what? You, you know Beethoven, pretty good pianist. On his deathbed, he pleaded with a friend, not so sure. And he said, I did have a certain amount of talent, didn't I? Oh, we can doubt anything. But there was a third prong, and when Satan asked this, there's a third question of doubt that comes in. Because, think of this, it says, did God say? And he brings doubt to the relationship. Because Eve wasn't there when God said it to Adam. God told Adam, all the trees, not that one. So Adam had to tell Eve sometime. So now that question means we have doubt between man and woman. Well, that works well, doesn't it? So there's this separation he's created from God, from self, from each other. And 
Then, it's what he asks. Did you catch this? So he says, did God say, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So he takes us back to this thing of, of has God spoken on the topic? <clears throat> Let me ask you a very serious question. Did God say, ice curling is worse than watching golf on TV? Did he? Well, I haven't heard that part. But it's a moot question, right? So you see what Satan did. He asked the question, did God really? And then he throws a moot question, which was never part of the equation. God didn't tell Adam, don't eat from any of the trees. So he tilted the question. I'm going to bring doubt on God. I'm going to bring doubt on himself. I'm going to bring doubt on each other. I'm going to ask a question that I they can't answer because it's not was it ever part of the equation. And then Eve fields the question. Woman says back, we can eat of the trees of the garden, but God did say, "Don't eat from the tree and the fruit that is in the, eat, the, eat from the, tr- the eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you'll die." Any of you who are scroll backers, go back through and see what God said to Adam. Did God say, "Don't touch it"? Nope. So what we have here. And we have the first marital miscommunication in history. <laughs> because either God said to Adam, hey, don't eat that tree. And Adam decided to add to it because he wasn't quite so sure he could trust Eve and said, don't even touch it. Or Eve heard what Adam said and decided to add some context to it and said, no, what it means is don't touch it. Whatever happened there, whether Adam was watching TV and not paying attention when he was relating the information, or Eve was adding a message that was never there to begin with, does that sound like male-female relationships? Whichever happened, behave. (laughs) Whatever happened is first miscommunication. But think about what that does. Because there was not accurate transmission of information, What's Eve's first thought when she touches the fruit? Because she believes, if I touch it, I'll die. She touches it and doesn't die. Who she start to question? Everybody. God first, probably Adam second, self third, or reverse of that, I don't care. Doubt comes in because the communication wasn't right. Wow, Satan's smart. Right? I mean, he just brought down so many. Can you imagine how easy life would be without sin? Ignore the part life without death because that was the original design. It's life without sin. And so then the interaction goes on because after this first miscommunication and, and the repositioning, then we have Satan saying back, In verse 4, you will surely not die. Think of implications. God's lying or God's wrong? Which one is it? God said the ramifications are going to be death. Satan is saying, nope. There's only two options. God's wrong or God's lying. Do you need a God who's a liar? I don't need one of those. Do you need a God who's wrong? I don't need one of those either. So here's what's left. If Satan is right and kind of putting the screws to Adam and Eve here, by the way, I don't know if you caught the end, it says Adam was there the whole time. So this isn't blame one person. Because Adam kept his mouth shut when he should have opened it. How funny is that? Nonetheless, Here's the problem we have now. If God is wrong, then we have to sort out when God is wrong. That means you and I have to go to work on every decision that's ever made and go right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. You know who that makes us? If I'm the arbiter and judge of all that is right and wrong, that makes me God. Ever been wrong? We asked that question earlier. 
So if I've ever been wrong, but my job is to be God, and I am God, but I'm not God because I've been wrong, and you're God but not God because you're wrong too, then you know what that tells us? There is no God. See what he just did? Now, how absurd would it be to walk in the Garden of Eden and not realize God was real? Not realize that the one who created everything and gave everything knew everything. Ever been foolish before? So, here's the tension. Satan says God's lying or God's wrong. God has said, don't. Just everything else is fine. Jeremiah prophesies about God that he says to us as humanity, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The God who theoretically knows everything that can't be known before it can be known. Titus 1 2 says, God does not lie. Hebrews 6 18 says, It's impossible for God to lie. John 8 44 says, Satan is the father of lies. Who do you trust? Because Satan could have been right. So who do you trust? And on who will you lean when it comes down to making those decisions of did God speak or not, right and wrong? And the conclusion of the matter of that second is, says you won't die. Well, we know now he was wrong, right? So let's go back to who do I trust? The one that makes me doubt God, the one that makes me doubt me, the one that makes me doubt you. Or the one that lied and got caught. And then the last interaction, after he says, you won't die, he says, but God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like him knowing good and evil. Rise to your full potential. Be all you can be. You deserve. Oh, it drives me nuts. I want you to watch for this. How many commercials now are you deserve? You deserve the hair you want. You deserve the body you want. You deserve the car you want. You, you de- it, it just goes on and on and on. It, it, it drives me nuts. I have the belly I deserve. <laughs> I ate my way there. How about you? You know, we, we really, for the most part, we probably have what we deserve. But here, that's that's the button Satan is pressing, and my goodness gracious, it's loud in our world right now. No, God doesn't. No, no, He just knows you'll be like Him. You'll get to this higher level of understanding and this great experience of stuff that you want. He's questioning God's motives. God knows you want it. He doesn't want to give it to you. It's good for you. You'll like it. That fruit's shiny. He positions that in front of them. Adam and Eve say, yes, we want to be our full potential. And the fruit was shiny. And it tasted good for a moment. Do you spot how long it lasted? Even in those verses, without reading the rest of the chapter, they ate it and their eyes were opened. Oh, they understood more than they understood before. Was it good for them? In in case, just to reiterate the the whole what's going to happen in the end, the curse, verses 16 through 19, says, To the woman he said, I'll greatly increase pains in childbearing. The pain you'll give birth by your children, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. By the way, that's an interesting one because he used two words for warfare. Um, To to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the the tree without... which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns, thistles, you'll do plants of the field through those. And you'll work and sweat. I, I, who's been in agriculture? If you didn't have to deal with weeds and pests, what percent of your time and money was dealing with weeds and pests? enough 
Just play that back. Women, childbirth, no pain. Which one? I'll take laughter as of this. <clears throat> and it is interesting, that whole uh, wife's desire will be for her husband and, and, and he will rule over her. And, and the two words basically mean, and it's kind of funny, the position, the, the, the aim of the curse here. So it, it's to overcome him, to conquer him, and, and he won't be conquered. And by the way, instead he's going to look over here at work, it's driving him. Does that sound familiar? Any of you women think you can fix your guy? Oh, come on now. <laughs> Guys, ever get distracted by work and not pay enough attention to home? Give me a grunt. And, and here, this, this is the curse on it all. Um, by the way, my ultimate question here is, was it worth knowing? Adam and Eve did indeed learn something. The fruit was shiny, and it tasted good, and they learned the difference between good and evil. You suppose they're glad they learned it? Because they go hide from God, right? They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Angel of flashing sword, no one ever goes back. Any regrets, you think? Do you know anything today you wish you didn't know? Ever wandered down a path where God had spoken and you went, yeah, but I really want, and, and for me, and this time it won't. And found out you learned stuff you really kind of wish you didn't know. Maybe God was right that he's given it all for joy and enjoyment, which are two different things that cover pretty much every mistake we've made. What if God's just that smart because he made us and cares so much? About I, is there a chance the tree's still around? The bad one. Try this out. They saw that it was good to look at and good to eat. There was pleasure involved in the fruit. Um, is there any chance that you have anything, at least one in your life, where you go, man, that looks good. But I know it's not what God said. Any temptation? Any place where you go, I'd like to think, go, do, whatever. And God goes, not for you. Because if that tree is around, it emphasizes another fairly important tree. Because if there is a tree of knowledge of good and evil that is still temptation, there is also still a tree of life. It still redeems. So that when we have fallen and made our Adam and Eve mistake, we still have a Savior. We still have a way back, and so do the people around us. How big is God's love? The one who knew us before He formed us in the womb and knew we would need to come back and come back and come back and come back. He left us a tree. That takes us to forever. That's your tree. I want to plant some seeds of doubt as I close. There's a trust of God. There's a trust of Satan. I want to encourage, I want to plant the seeds of doubt in Satan. That's not so hard. But how about this one? I want to plant the seeds of doubt because there's sometimes that sit opposite each other. We have Christ and we have culture. Just answer this question. Does Jesus need more culture? Does the culture need more Jesus? If we think the culture needs to look more like Jesus, then I want to plant some seeds of doubt in the culture. But we would doubt the whispers of Satan. We would doubt the whispers of the culture. And listen to the Creator and listen to the Christ. If we have ever sinned, it meant we doubted 
when we faced the Adam and Eve conundrum and we lost. Okay, there's still another tree. Every likelihood, the tree of knowledge of good and evil still has fruit and still shines. You probably still know some of that fruit. This morning, as I plant the seeds of doubt towards Satan and towards culture, I want to encourage you. I want to ask the elders to come up front, as I sometimes do, and just be available. And if you have a fruit that you know, just want to encourage you to come say, I've got a fruit. Can you pray with me? Don't need to talk about what it is, or you can if you want. Well, I want to ask you to take a step towards doubting the liar and doubting what isn't God and look into the tree that works. Would you pray with me? Lord God, how great and almighty, how everlasting, how overflowing the love that you have given us. I, I, we don't have the words for what you offer knowing us. We know us and you know us and we know where we've fallen and you know where we've fallen. Thank you for calling us home, for giving us a Savior, for giving us the ability to sing like we've sung that we know and we trust and that you are always and ever will be. Help us place our doubt carefully in the places worth doubting so we can free up our trust to experience the joy and the enjoyment that you have for us. Thank you so much for forgiveness for taking us home. It's in Christ we will always and only pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing our closing song.